Hi Tacoma, welcome back to your third grade TV classroom. Today is Thursday, November 12th, and I'm Mrs. Oslin. As always, let's take a moment to check in with our zones. Think about what emotion are you feeling? Think about your I message. You'll remember an I message sounds like, I feel hmm because hmm. And think about how strongly you're feeling your emotion. Take some think time. I'm gonna model sharing my I message with Rafa. Rafa, I'm feeling a little bit frazzled this morning because we're having some technical problems here at our TV classroom. I'm gonna practice taking some deep breaths while you share your iMessage with your learning buddy, someone in the room with you, or with me on the screen. I hope you had a great day off yesterday, and I can't wait to see the writing that you send to us here at the TV Classroom about Veterans Day. Now, you'll remember that we have been practicing our stop and stay cool steps. And our stop and stay cool steps are important when we recognize that we're feeling something really strongly, and we feel like we might say or do something that we know we shouldn't. Now, the first step in the stop and stay cool steps is to say, I feel like I'm losing control. Then you stop. Third, you give yourself a chili hug. And then you practice breathing in for five and out for five. Then you should be cool enough to think about your I message and tell someone how you're feeling and why. You'll also remember that we have been practicing win-win solutions for when we have a conflict with someone. And a win-win solution is when both people get some of what they want and both people feel okay about it. We've also been practicing the peace path when we have a conflict with someone. The first step on the peace path is to tell the problem. This is where you share your I message with whoever it is that you're in a conflict with. And then that person has an opportunity to say it back to you so that you and they both know that they heard you and know how you're feeling. Then they get an opportunity to share their I message and you get an opportunity to say it back to them. The second step in the peace path is to brainstorm solutions. So this is where you both think about what possible win-win solutions you could use to solve this conflict. And you'll remember, we've been talking about a lot of different win-win solutions. The ones we talk the most about are share, take turns, apologize, get help if, there's, if you can't think of a win-win solution that would work. And then together, you decide which win-win solution you're going to try, and then you solve the problem together. Now, today, I want to teach you how readers use text evidence to make an inference. Now, text evidence is proof from the text using the words from the author or the pictures from the illustrator. And to make an inference means to decide what the characters are thinking or feeling when the author may not directly tell us. Now, we're going to be starting a new reading and writing unit tomorrow, so if you haven't had the opportunity to pick up your new reading and writing packet from your teacher, please do that. In your current ELA packet, we have used these discussion starters to help us think about and write about what we're thinking about when we read a book. And today we're going to focus on these four topics. The first one is a confirmation. So I think, I believe, or it seems to be that. And these are sentence starters that we're gonna use today when we're talking and writing about making inferences in our book. You could also use, if you're confused or unsure about what's happening, you could say, I don't understand, or I'm confused about. If you wanted to extend or take a thinking to the next level, you could say, this makes me think, I want to know more about, now I'm wondering, or you could review, which is you could say, I want to go back to what hmm said, 
Or you could say, I don't think I understand. So keep these discussion starters in your mind as we're reading and you're thinking about what's happening in the story. Now, the story we're gonna read today is called The Bee Tree and it's by Patricia Polacco. And it's about a little girl and an adventure she goes on with her grandfather. Now, while we're reading, I want you thinking about what the characters are thinking or feeling, what they're saying, and why they might do what they're doing. Think about those three things. I'm tired of reading, Grandpa, Mary Ellen sighed. I'd rather be outdoors running and playing. So you don't feel like reading, eh? Feel like running, do you? Then I expect this is just the right time to find a bee tree, he said, taking down a jar and putting it on his lucky hat, and putting on his lucky hat. What's a bee tree, Grandpa? Mary Ellen asked. Well, it's where the bees make their home. It's where they keep the honey, the sweetest in the land, Grandpa chirped excitedly. But we already have honey, Grandpa, Mary Ellen said. Ah, but not honey like this, her Grandpa answered with a wink. Mary Ellen and her grandpa put on their coats and went outdoors. They walked down past the hollyhocks to the garden and found bees gathering pollen from the flowers. Her grandpa carefully trapped some in the glass jar, making sure not to hurt them. When he was sure that he had enough, he smiled and leaned close to Mary Ellen. They'll take the pollen back to the hive to make it into honey and we'll be right behind, him, right behind them. Then he slowly loosened the lid of the jar let one single bee escape. It stayed on the mouth of the jar for a moment, flew straight up, then buzzed toward the cornfield. Quick, now run, Grandpa called out as he began to chase the bee. Just then, Mrs. Govlock from down the creek way was walking baby Sylvester in his carriage. Mary Ellen and her grandpa ran by them. We're off to find a bee tree today, Grandpa shouted. I haven't done that since I was a girl. Mrs. Govlock said excitedly, may I come too? Grandpa motioned her to follow and the three of them were off and running. Baby Sylvester laughed out loud as his carriage bumped and bounced through the rows of corn. Honk, went a goose as it waddled after them. Now, take some think time and think about what you're thinking about. What are you noticing? is happening so far in this story. What connection do you have? Or what do you think is going to happen next? Take some think time. Now I'm gonna model sharing my thinking using one of these sentence starters with Rafa. Rafa, it seems to be that Grandpa and Mary Ellen are going on this crazy adventure chasing bees. And I wonder what's going to happen next. Now you take a moment to share your thinking with your learning buddy. Now, let's keep reading, and as we do, keep these sentence starters in your brain to help guide your thinking and speaking. <clears throat> as they came from the cornfield and, and crossed Dietz Junction, Einar Tundervold came around the bend on his squeaky old bike. Where are you all going in such a hurry? He asked. A bee tree, Mary Ellen puffed as the foursome scurried by, chasing a bee to its tree. This I would like to do also, he said as he stood up and pedaled faster. The wheels of his bike went twiddle, twiddle, squeak. Their boots slapped the ground. The buggy pitched and swayed and the goose honked as they ran after that bee. The bee swooped down, stopped, held in midair, then circled past them and headed straight for St. Joe River. Olav Lundhagen, while strolling on the nearby shore with the charming Herman sisters, Petra and Dorma, looked up and noticed the commotion coming toward them. Where are you all going? He called out. To a bee tree we are going, Einar Tundervold puffed as he pedaled by. Can we come too? The two lovely ladies pleaded. Fast, you'll have to run, Einar said. 
We don't care, let's go. The three shouted as they raced after him. Slap, bump, honk, tweedle, tweedle, squeak, bump. As they went, they all went as they sped down the road after that bee. Klondike, Bertha Fitchworth, just back from an expedition in the Yukon, had car trouble next to the road. She looked up just in time to see everybody running by. You say you're after a bee tree? She shrieked. Zown, zounds, that won't be easy, but Eureka, what an adventure. She sprinted along behind them. The bee dipped and soared as it made its way out of sight. Now, let's check in. Take some think time. Use one of these sentence starters to guide your thinking. Now, I'm noticing that all of the characters that they're passing by are joining them to go on this hunt for a bee tree. And I wonder if this is something that's really common in their culture or in their town. It's not something I've ever seen or heard of. Go ahead and share your thinking. Now, let's keep reading. But Grandpa carefully let out let another out, and the chase was on again. The noisy merry bunch galloped up over Bird Talk Fellow Ridge, only to run smack dab into Fiduciary Longdrop's herd of goats. The goats bleated and bucked as the people clamored through them. What ho, Fiduciary called out. You're going to scare me goats. A bee tree, a voice called back. With that, Fiduciary tooted his flute, and he and his flock joined the chase. Bounding billy billies, this will be great, he said on a dead run. Three traveling musicians looked up just in time to see the thundering stampede of goats, buggies, people, and bikes coming straight for them. Why are they all running, Pa? One of the boys asked his father. We're after that bee, Grandpa said, pointing at the small dot in the sky. It's leading us to a bee tree, Mary Ellen wailed as she streaked by them. Come on along, Klondike, Bertha chortled as she huffed past. Slap, bump, bleat, honk, tweedle, tweedle, squeak, thump. They went as they ran. Hoofs clattered. Rows of corn were parted. Nothing really mattered but chasing that bee. They ran through Griner's Bluff and into Bishop's Meadow, around Dead Man's Tree, and then to Bird Talk Hollow. As they ran down the hollow, the bee took blinding speed and disappeared from their sight. They all stopped to catch their breath just in front of Dunk's Woods. Grandpa handed the jar with the last bee in it to Mary Ellen, and she let it out. Sure enough, it flew straight and low right into Dunk's Woods. Everyone set about to build a smoke fire from twigs and damp leaves. When the smoke had quieted the beads, Grandpa balanced on Einer's bicycle and reached into the tree. As he pulled out small pieces of honeycomb, he dropped them into some of baby Sylvester's spare clean diapers that Klondike Bertha was holding. Mary Ellen tied them into neat little bundles and Mr. Lundhagen put them into the baby carriage. The musicians played merrily as the Herman sisters danced. Grandpa invited everyone back to the house for baking powder biscuits, fresh brewed tea, and of course, the honey. There was music, dancing, tall tales, and raucous laughter as they all buzzed about the sweet adventure of that day. Grandpa took Mary Ellen inside away from the crowd. Now, child, I am going to show you what my father showed me and his father before him he said quietly. He spooned the honey onto the cover of one of her books. Taste, he said, almost in a whisper. Mary Ellen savored the honey on her book. There is such sweetness inside of that book too, he said thoughtfully. Such things, adventure, knowledge, and wisdom. But these things do not come easily. You have to pursue them. Just like we ran after the bees to find their tree. So you must also chase these things through the pages of a book. Then, 
he smiled and hugged her. Now, think about at the beginning of this book, The Bee Tree, Grandpa, or Mary Ellen, says she doesn't want to read. And so Grandpa took her on this adventure. Now, make an inference about why you think Grandpa did that. Take some think time. Now, the author and illustrator don't come out and just tell us exactly what the lesson is. We have to infer. We kind of have to figure it out for ourselves based on what we think and what we know and what they did tell us in the words and the pictures. From that day on, Mary Ellen never again complained about her reading. She found it to be every bit as exciting as a wild chase through the Michigan countryside and as sweet as the honey from a bee tree. Now, we used text evidence, words from the text and the pictures, and we used what we know and what we think to make an inference about this text, the bee tree. This is something that strong readers do. And while you're independently reading today, I want you to pause and think and make some decisions, make some inferences about the characters and the story, even when the author and the illustrator don't give you all the information. Use these sentence starters that are in your ELA packet to help guide your thinking and writing today. You're also going to continue practicing using clues to learn new words. And pay attention to when meaning breaks down, which means when do you get to a word that you know you don't understand or an entire text. If you're reading an entire text and you don't know what it, what's happening or what it's about and you can't remember, use these strategies to help you figure it out. Also, pay attention to when you notice that your mind starts to think about things other than what you're reading and go back to this how to stay focused document to help you refocus. Continue adding to your reading log, reading for longer and longer periods of time and check in with your teacher and make sure you let them know what it is that you're working on and what goals you're setting. Now, the materials that you're going to need for math are your whiteboard and marker, your learning buddy and your counters. You're gonna take your five minute break and then be back here for math with Mrs. Wally. Thank you so much for reading and thinking today with me. I will see you tomorrow. Bye.
All right, welcome back third graders. I hope you have a great break. Today, you notice I am not in the studio with Mr. Kevin and Ms. Soslin. I'm actually at my home because my son is home sick. So we're gonna try this out from my home office. Isn't that great? So I do have my little whiteboard, so I'll be using that today. And I might get confused on which side is which at first, but we'll, we'll get through it. So let's count by fives. Are you ready? Now, why would I want us to count by fives? Hmm. Oh, because when we multiply by fives, we count by fives. And if you've noticed, a lot of the times when we decompose those factors, we get five as one of those factors a lot. So five is one of those numbers you really want to know your facts for. So if you can skip count by fives, and you can learn your facts really easily. So let's go ahead and start. I'm going to pull up the highlighter just like I do when I'm in the studio. Here we go. Are you ready? Five, 10, 15, 20. Count with me. 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100. Excellent job. And I just remembered, I forgot to set my timer. So I'm going to do that right now so that we don't go over our time. Are you ready? Okay. I think we're good to go. So what's missing Thursday? Are you ready? And I may play around with my picture like this just so that we can see everything. So what's missing Thursday? Hmm. What do you think should go in this blank? Hmm, how are you gonna figure that out? Okay, so you can start at 24 and count up to 64 and see how many are in between. Yeah, because we have a whole and a part. And we can do that to find the other part, can't we? You could also subtract. 64 minus 24 is what? It's 40. Sometimes the number line is faster, sometimes subtracting is faster. Now, I'm writing with my mouse today, so my writing might be a little bit messy, but I think we can handle it, right there, graders? Right. Okay, so that one was 40. Let's go to the next one. 64 minus blank equals 22. What do you want to do? You want to subtract? Well, what's 64 minus 20? 44. And what's 44 minus 2? 40. Two, fantastic. Now, mm, we don't have the whole, but what do we have? We have two parts, don't we? Because subtraction is a whole minus a part equals the other part. So what do we do when we have two parts to find the whole? Yeah, we put them together. What's 44 plus 22? Yeah, it's 66. Great. Now, I had a 44 plus tw 22. Now it's going to be 44 plus 32. What is 44 plus 32? Well, what was 44 plus 22? 66. This went up by 10. So our whole has to go up by 10. So it's 76. Excellent work, third graders. Okay. Here we go. 86 minus blank equals 32. What are you going to do? So you want to do 86 minus 32? Or do you want to do 32 and count up to 86? You decide. Okay. 32, 42, 52, 62, 72, 82. That's 50. And then I'm at 82. How do I get to 86? I have four more. That's 54. Awesome. 54. Okay. Now, I'm going to move myself a little bit. Today, we're learning to use what we know about multiplication to help us solve unknown problems. So, what is four times three? What's four times three? And how are you going to figure it out? Okay, some people might do two times three plus two 
times three. What is two times three? Six plus six. So what's four times three? Four times three is 12. Awesome job. Now this is where I'm gonna use this whiteboard and I'm actually gonna make my video a little bit bigger for us. If it'll let me, let's see, is it gonna let me do it? It did earlier. Oh, isn't this magic? It's like magic. So, oh, and maybe I'm as big as I can go. Let's see. Oh, it's there. Yep, I'm as big as I can go. Okay, so I've got my whiteboard here. And I'm going to use it to write down what we see. So let's read the problem first. This is Ava's mom buys two packs of three t-shirts. Okay. Her dad buys three packs of two t-shirts. How many t-shirts did each of Ava's parents buy? So what is that asking us to figure out? Yeah, we have to figure out how many packs mom buys and how, or how many t-shirts mom buys and how many t-shirts dad buys. So I'm gonna split my board and I want you to do the same. I'm gonna split my board right here in half. So go ahead and split your board in half like that. Okay, so we've got mom, I'm gonna put M for mom and D for dad. What do we know about Ava's mom? Ava's mom has two packs of three t-shirts. So I'm actually gonna draw two packs in each pack, there's three. You go ahead and draw that with me. Now, Dad has three packs, and there's two in each pack. What's the multiplication equation you're going to write right here? What are you going to put right there? Yeah, two groups of three equals blank. Hey, okay, what are you going to do for this one? Three roots of two equals blank. Now, wait a minute. Look at those factors. What do you see? Both problems have the same factors, two and three. I wonder what's going to happen to the product when we multiply. Do you think the product's going to be different or similar or the same? Let's do it. What's two times three? Six. And what's three times two? Six. Did the order of the factors make a difference? No, it didn't, did it? So interesting. Let's look, go ahead and clear your board. Let's look at the next slide. And I'm gonna have you just be writing some equations down on this next slide. I'm gonna move myself and make myself a little bit smaller again because I want you to be able to read what's going on on the screen. Okay, so it says, look ahead. You've seen how the order of factors in multiplication problem affects the product, but what about how you group factors? Hmm, how we group factors, and what do we mean by that? Let's look at this problem. Are you ready? Let's look. Jane buys four boxes of hot dogs, okay? You see them, four boxes of hot dogs, and each box has two packs. Okay, but there's more. Each pack has five hot dogs. Ooh, that's a lot. How many hot dogs did she buy? So your brain might be going, ooh, this is so much. But remember with math, sometimes it feels like a lot, but if we break it down and we go step by step, it makes, starts to make sense. So I said one way to think about this is to first find how many packs there are. So let's do that. Four groups of two packs is how many packs? What's four groups of two? Or two groups of four, right? Can you switch them? You can do four groups of two or two groups of four. It doesn't matter. You still get what? Eight. So we know there's eight packs of hot dogs. We can even count it here in the picture. One, two, two, four, six, eight, right? There's eight. So if you look at how they wrote this, they said four times two packs is eight packs. So they put this four times two in parentheses. So on your board, I want you to write this right here and then the equal sign. And then now the part that's red, that's what we're gonna write here on the line. This is saying four groups of two times five is the same as whatever four times two is, which is 
eight times five. Now that doesn't feel so bad, does it? Now we skipped counted by fives, didn't we? Let's do it again, ready? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. Eight times five is 40. Okay, so we have 40. So now we know that she bought 40 hot dogs. Okay, but it says there's another way to think about it. Another way to think about this is to first find out how many hot dogs are in each box and then multiply by the number of boxes. So we did the packs and then we multiplied the number of hot dogs in each pack to find out how many hot dogs. This is saying, first of all, let's find out how many hot dogs we have and then we'll say how times the amount of packs. So instead of four times two, four groups of two packs, now we have two groups of five hot dogs in one pack. So we're first figuring out how many hot dogs are in one pack. Okay, so what is two times five? Two times five is 10. So each box is going to have 10 hot dogs, okay? And how many boxes? It says there's four boxes. Each box has two packs. So here we go, four boxes. And how many hot dogs did we say were in each box? 10, which was two times five. So four boxes of 10 hot dogs equals 40. We got the same answer. Okay, so now it says how are four times two times five and four times two times five alike and different? Hmm. What's similar about them? Yeah, the product is 40, right? What's different about those two equations that we did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the first one, we figured out the packs, right? And how many packs we had. And then we multiplied that by how many hot dogs were in each pack. So that was the first way. First, we figure out how many packs we have, and then we multiplied that by this many groups times this many hot dogs in each group equals the total number of hot dogs. The second way, what did we do? Yeah, we figured out that how many hot dogs were in one pack or in one box, and then we multiplied that by the number of boxes, and that still told us how many hot dogs we have. We can do it either way. The picture though looks different. Do you see how the picture's different? This one is, we figured out how many packs and then multiplied by the hot dogs. And this one, we just figured out how many hot dogs and then multiplied it by the boxes, okay? okay. Let's move on. So now it says reflect. Is finding for you, I want you to think about it for a second. I'm gonna go back to the page in a second so you can see it. Is finding four, four times two times five or four times two times five easier for you. Which way made more sense? That's the first time we've seen this. So if it's feeling a little confusing, that's okay. Which one makes the most sense to you? You're just reflecting. Go ahead and tell your learning buddy, which one made the most sense to you and why? Why did that make the most sense? That might sound something like, the one that made the most sense to me was because Go ahead, you can do it. Okay, awesome job. Now, factor. Factor is our vocabulary word. Everybody say factor. Now, it's not written here. I'm gonna try and write it as best I can with my mouse. It's very hard to do, but let's see if I can do it. Factor. What is a factor? Hmm. Well, if I think one multiplication equation, this is what I always talked about decomposing factors. So the two numbers you multiply together, what are factors? They're either the groups or the number of groups. And I'm wondering if I can type in here. Let's see if it will let me type. Let's see. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Eraser, laser pen. Doesn't look like it's gonna let me type. So I'm gonna do the best I can. We have, let's do a picture. 
we have the groups. That's one of the factors, right? Or the amount in each group, right? So we either have this part, which is the groups, or this part, which is the amount in the group, right? Those are the factors, the group and the amount in each group, right? Yeah. So we've got groups times the amount in each group. Hmm, what should we draw a picture of? What do you think? Okay. We could do an array of three times two, three and two, three times two. These are the factors, right? These are the factors. Now, if I was writing with pen, this would be much neater, wouldn't it? Think of an example. What's an example of a factor? Three groups, or how about four packs of hot dogs? What's another example of a factor in that problem? Five hot dogs in each pack, yes. Okay, non-examples. 42 in all. Is that a factor? No, that's a product. Okay, what's another non-example of a factor? Hmm. Well, what about 74 hot dogs in all? No. 40 hot dogs in all. One example. Today for your homework, you're going to be doing this work. You're going to be doing your definition of a factor, an illustration, an example, and a non-example. Please remember that this work needs to get to your teacher so that they can see how you're doing and how you're understanding. Now, this is the first lesson in this, this is the first session in this group of lessons that we're gonna do. So if it's still feeling confusing, you're welcome to call your teacher, but know that this is just the beginning, the end of the next five sessions and you can really understand it. So the first problem you're gonna do down here, number two says, Gil says, Three times two times four, that means three times two. The groups three, three times two, so there's gonna be six groups times four, and three times two groups of four have the same product. Do you agree or disagree and why? You need to make sure that you're drawing pictures of both to see if you agree or disagree and find the product. Then you're gonna solve the problem here. It's very similar to our hot dog problem. Nadia's mom buys four packs of two pens. Her dad buys two packs of four pens. How many pens did each of Nadia's parents buy? It's just like that first problem we did. And then you're going to check your answer and show your work. Okay. All right. Today, did we analyze equations? Yep. Did we think about the different order? We did. We didn't say if it would help us solve more fluently. We'll get there. But... Do we look at the different order of putting those together and decide which one worked better for our brain? We did. And do we explain if the order of factors matters? Yes. Does it matter for finding a product? No. Does it matter if you're describing a situation? Yes. Think about the hot dogs. We had figuring out that there were eight packs total times five hot dogs in each pack, or we figured out that there were 10 hot dogs in each box times four boxes. Those pictures looked different. So we got the same product, but the situation pictures look different. So that's when the factors matter. You will still get the same answer. All right, now is my favorite part of the day. So I'm gonna try, I'm just gonna leave, I'm gonna go to the next page. So you can see mine, I'm making it a little bit bigger. Okay. Here's my favorite part of the day. It's time for our affirmation. So graders, you are doing such an amazing job of being flexible and being understanding at the TV classroom. Miss Oslin and I are still learning how to do all of this, and we appreciate your flexibility. So your affirmation for today is, I am a flexible learner. Because you are. You know how to be flexible. And that's one of the most amazing qualities you can have. It will take you a long way in your life. It's something that people are going to really appreciate about you. So I'm going to go first, and then you're going to go. I am a flexible learner. Your turn. All right, third graders, thank you so much. 
I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. We will see you tomorrow. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.